All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Dr. Risa Riger, who is in New York. How are you doing, Dr. I'm doing great. I'm so thrilled to be here with you and with your with your community. Yeah, and um, and uh, Risa is a clinical psychologist, international speaker, entrepreneur, and she's the founder of 93% Consulting and the creator of Disruptive Self-Ownership and has served on the Advisory Council of Mindfulness Without Borders. And you teach people and individuals and leaders how to authentically deliver powerful communication and she helps clients learn to self-manage, lead purposefully and intentionally and op optimize their performance so they can be seen, heard, and valued. Um, fantastic, fantastic subject today, because we're going to talk about how to become the leader of now using your proprietary disruptive uh, self-ownership. So I like the idea, um, uh, Risa, getting straight into it is, why do you think leaders need to change now? I mean, because, you know, often we talk about change and we talk about it incrementally and it's going to go over a period of time and we have to. But why, why is there a desperate need for leadership change now? People's lives have changed profoundly. And so when people's lives change profoundly, it also affects the workspace. And so here are leaders who are working with people who are involved in the pandemic, you know, dealing with the great resignation and work from home and hybrid workspace working in terms of keeping their teams together. And so what is it that leaders need to bring forth? What do they need to bring now to get on the mark, to be able to deliver to their team mates? And it comes to this, it's how to up your act, that you need to up your authenticity, your credibility and your trust. And this is what people are looking for now. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with you because I think, uh, you know, coming out of uh, we're coming out of very traditional structures of organizations. And unfortunately, most people, a lot of people still think in those terms, uh, you know, where you have employees and you have offices and all this. Now, this was changing before the pandemic, but the pandemic blew that up. Now you have organizations that are. Maybe they have offices, maybe they don't. Maybe they have some people in offices, maybe they don't. Maybe they have people who come in sometimes and not other times. Maybe they have people distributed over all over the world. Maybe they have a lot of contract resources now instead of, instead of um, full-time employees. But basically, it's all so distributed that you can't possibly lead or communicate in the same way that you used to. Absolutely. And that's a huge challenge. So how do you have impact? How do you have touch points with people who are in all different situations? And the other thing is that our boundaries have shifted so much that sometimes you're meeting with someone and your kid is coming through. You know, we see it all the time. Someone's in the middle of a meeting and their cat is walking across their mm -hmm. camera. Their dog is whining in the background, that there are all sorts of things that happen. And so these boundaries that we used to have are not that strict and hard. And so there is more of a need for humanity and connection. You know, we've seen it, we've heard all about it. People are needing connection. And one of the ways that they look for connection, because we spend so much of our waking lives in work, is that we need to find connection in our work life as well. Yeah, no, I, 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 tot I totally agree with you. And I think it's and I think it's a real challenge, as, as we said, is especially people coming out of traditional leadership, because in some ways in leadership, it was always like that you kind of created a little bit of a myth around you. So you're a little bit removed. And and that now is obviously um, obviously that doesn't really work as well now with the, with the distributed um, workforce. But also, as you said, with people looking for that humanity, looking for that human connection. And you mentioned the authenticity piece. And, and I find that interesting because you you got everybody now coming out with, okay, improve your authenticity or become more authentic. And and it and it's almost become it's almost become like a bumper sticker as opposed to something serious in uh, in the way that people like yourself talk about it. 
It's it's very serious. And what people and some people fail to realize is that it isn't something that you just kind of change your shirt and you look a little more um, approachable in your attire. That authenticity goes like this, and there's a neuroscience component to it. And this is the neuroscience piece, which is that in us, we have kind of a, a nonsense meter. We have a meter that really picks up on when there seems to be a disconnect. And so, for example, there was somebody I was working with who met with their boss and their boss was saying one thing, but they were feeling something very, very different. And it turned out that when they took away the words and just went with what was happening in the feel sense, that they noticed that there really was a tremendous disconnect in what this person was saying and how they were communicating it in full in terms of body language. And so it just set the alarms off. So authenticity has to be authentic. And the only way that it can be authentic is when you authentically connect with yourself. And there are very specific steps. I mean, um, unfortunately, we can't get into everything sure. today, but how do you authentically connect with yourself? And you have to figure out where your North Star is in terms of you. Now, as a, as a leader, you can't change your whole company. And you may not be able to brand your whole company, but you can brand yourself of who is it that you are? Who is it that you want to be? And who are you truly? And what can you deliver to your people in a way that has them be heard, be seen, and be valued? Because that's what each and every one, one of us wants from our earliest times throughout our lives. So what, one of the challenges I see here, and I think this is this is uh, a challenge a lot of people face is, I mean, a lot of people will probably say, well, yeah, this all makes sense. Sounds good. Yeah, I must do that. But they don't make mm -hmm. time for themselves. They don't make time to be with themselves. And we live in this culture today that says, oh, no, you don't need time for yourself. You've got these things you've got everything you can be let's distract you a hundred percent of that even when you're having a conversation with somebody it's now become almost permissible for the other person to glance down at their text messages halfway through the conversation once upon a time something like that would have been considered rude now it's considered you know just par for the course but what i'm saying is people have to consciously separate themselves in order to do the work that you're that you're talking about and that, that is to address the self Yes, but this is this is where this is where I love to address this, which is that it also needs to make sense within the structure and the confines of what our lives look like on a daily basis. So we can't say, OK, now I'm going to take two weeks and go off and connect with myself because that isn't going to happen. Sure. So how do we make this manageable and real? Because we are really in our lives, we are really needing to respond to the challenges. So how do we begin to do that? And one way is to start literally checking in with yourself and what it is that you're experiencing. If you can't identify your own inner experience, that's going to be your first roadblock in being authentic. Because you need to know what's going on with you to make sure that you're in alignment within yourself. And even though this may sound abstract, it is also not abstract because it really, really comes down to very specific uh, behaviors, things to practice, and how you notice yourself. And when you become curious about yourself, actually curious, because we are fearful. We have beliefs that have developed over time. And this mm -hmm. is where disruptive self-ownership comes in, is that... You know, we update our phones, we update our apps, we don't wear shoes that we wore when we were eight or nine years old, but we hold on to old stories about ourselves and beliefs about ourselves that really don't hold water anymore, that aren't true anymore. So we need to break through and dispel those old beliefs to be able to really be in our 10.0 selves and live it. And what that means also, John, is that it's not all pretty pretty, but it means that we are connecting with all aspects of ourselves, all facets of ourselves, the wonderful, the meh, and also the really messy parts of who we are, because being a human being is in part messy. This is not pristine. And when we welcome that in, 
that it gives our people, the people that we want to have the most impact with, that we care, we want them to succeed, which is another component of this, is that we need to address our own messiness to be able to help the people that we work with really get through and be able to develop in ways that really get to their own 10.0, which keeps getting revised over time. Yeah, no, I, lo I love that piece about, um, you know, the, the self-ownership, because I think the the accountability factor is a massive thing. And and unfortunately, it takes some of us, to, sometimes it takes a long time for us to figure this out. But once you figure out and realize that you're accountable for your own life uh, and you're accountable for how you react to it, you're accountable for the decisions you make and you don't externalize things and you start, it's very liberating actually. And I think that's the, I, I understand what you said about fear. It is fearful, absolutely. But when you come out the other side, it's extremely liberating. Absolutely. And people really feel that. I mean, if you think about all the leaders that you've worked with, right, and you've been in meetings and who is that person that when they speak, you perk up, you want to listen, all of a sudden you're really ready to take in that information. And what is it about that person? That there's something about that that really rings true. I mean, it's smart. There are lots of people who are smart. There are people who know their subject matter, but it's more than that. So what makes you that go-to person? What makes you the leader that people want to be on your team or they wish that they could? that you're the one who's listened to, that you get the eyes on. And when things are hitting the fan, that you become the go-to, that you're the innovator and the one who can keep the ship moving along. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I think the, the other part of it too is uh, a lot of people, as we said, they talk about authenticity. They talk about all of this stuff and being vulnerable and it all, all of this. And it sounds all it's all wrapped up to sound like it's all very Pollyanna in some ways. Right. As opposed to what you're talking about is the practical. And I think and and as you say, I love that what you say about, you know, the human experience is a messy one. Yeah. You know, our lives are messy. Um, but it seems like when we get into a work context, we try to put everything in a box and we don't we don't. Uh, acknowledge that work is made of people and their lives are messy too. So therefore we have to be innovative. We have to be flexible and, and, and we have to be, you know, insightful. That says it right then and there. And also that when people are going to make mistakes, people are going to get it wrong. And so how do we make space for that when we're really committed to developing people? And when we're able to embrace our own messiness, we understand and we can let a little bit of it hang out. And we don't have to be that worried that all of a sudden, if I show one little crack or that's the perception, like th people are going to think that I'm nothing. And that's not true. We're not in the space of all or nothing, but we can lead with a degree of humanity that allows other people to feel safe. When people are feeling safe and people are feeling that they're in an environment where they're being trusted, and it's, I think it's Stephen Covey who says, nothing moves as fast as the speed of trust. Mm -hmm. And when you're in a space where you feel that you're being regarded well, that you're being trusted, it opens you up. As a, as a team member, as somebody coming into work who's really available to give your best because you're not that impeded by this kind of worry that I have to just kind of do it just like that. And it becomes a safe and more secure environment for you so that you're able to not hold back so much in fearfulness of imperfection. Yeah, no, I, I think that's I, I would underline, triple underline what you just said there, because I mean, personally, I trust experts more when I ask them questions and, and every so often they say, mm, don't know the answer to that. That's not my area. I have no idea. And and rather than rather than uh, uh, rather than undermine them, for me, it reinforces the trust because it, here's an expert on something and they're saying, hmm, don't know anything about that. And therefore, I believe I'm more in, I'm more inclined to believe the rest of what they say. That be, that helps you to become the go-to person because no one wants to, when they're having a problem, nobody wants to go somewhere and just be shined up. You need to be able to get information that's truly going to be of help to you. And so when you're that person who says, I'm not sure, I don't know that, or I need to go find out about that, 
give me a little bit of time and let me come back to you. People, not only do you have credibility, but you also have that trust that you're going to get something that's been thought through, isn't a throwaway, and that it gets the seriousness that it deserves. And you're, you're counting on this person. We're in an interdependent world. Mm -hmm. And it's in that interdependence where we can feel that we have our go-to people. And how has that happened? It's happened over time with this person being authentic, being um, credible, and being trustworthy. So when it hits the fan, they're the person to go to, that you're that person. Yeah, and I like the way what you mentioned there about it happens over time. Because here's another thing I think that the pervasive culture today you know thrusts upon us the idea of everything should be immediate it should be instantaneous uh, i should you know i shouldn't have to wait for anything i should have a solution but what you just talked about there those are things that are built up over time they're not instantaneous and therefore it runs a little bit almost counterculture today but it's so important that we slow down to speed up Agreed. And that relationship building, building takes time. A building doesn't happen all at mm -hmm. once. You know, even if you have a great meal in front of you, you can't eat it all at once. All you can do is take it and go through it bite by bite. And that's how relationships are built. We build our relationships. We build our brand. We build who we are and how we show up for our work lives in our relationships with uh, the people who need us, who need us to really do our best and to be able to let them know when we need more information or we need more of a database to be able to make decisions. Yeah, and and I think the uh, as you mentioned there about you know the relationship with yourself that also takes some time as well. I mean that takes an investment of time and energy to to work work through that so it's almost like you have to establish a relationship with self and then start establishing the relationships with others that's the start point and so there are parts of ourselves that we own there are parts of ourselves that we kind of own sometimes and there are parts of ourselves that we've abandoned we've condemned and we have really given up on we don't want to see and we have this illusion that oh i've just turned the page on that but that's really an illusion. That's a piece of mythology because unless you deal with it, you may have turned the page on it, but you haven't really dealt with it and brought it up to date and taken from it what you need to know to help you go forward. We have things that happen that we feel disappointed about that are hurtful to us, but there's something to be learned about looking at it and what do we learn? What do we bring forward with it? If you're just shutting the book, if you're just saying, well, that doesn't exist anymore, it comes up at the worst possible moments out of your awareness and it can hijack and impede you or be the boulder in the road for you. Yeah, I'm, I, I I love that too, because I do think that that's, uh, we all have triggers as well, right? We have things that trigger us that we're not always aware of or that we haven't identified. And I think, and often, as you said, often they can be think, can go all the way back to your childhood and suddenly you're sitting in a meeting and somebody says something and it triggers something and you don't know why you suddenly feel all tense or, or whatever. Uh, and I think also identifying those triggers in ourselves are really important because as you say, if you just kind of close the book on it, you never know when that little trigger is going to spring. And you can't take control over it and use it for yourself and to understand this is what happens. Oh, yeah. When this kind of situation comes up, I get into a difficult space in myself. And one of the things that you're talking about, but I'm going to really highlight it, mm -hmm. is the importance of the information that we get, not just with our thinking, but the importance of the information that we get in our bodies as well. Our bodies, and it is are an enormous source of information. It's one of the challenge channels of information that we have within ourselves. And when we disregard what we're experiencing in our bodies, we are really turning the volume off of a lot of important channels because our brain exists not only in our head, but we also have the embodied brain around our organs and in our bodies. And we need to pay attention to that because it's there to help us. And sometimes it's screaming at us, but we need mm -hmm. to listen to it.
Yeah, no, I, I totally agree because I'm I'm big on the whole mind the mind body connection, and it's kind of we we've done a disservice I think over the years where we split out everything like you know you bang your knee you go to the doctor you're depressed you go to the psychiatrist or whatever, but never the twain shall actually communicate in any mean meaningful fashion. So everything gets treated in 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 isolation. And it's not that hard to do. Mm -hmm. It's an it's a new experience, but it's really not that hard to do. I teach people how to do it all the time. And when they are working with me and they'll say to me, you know, Dr. Riger, I this is what I was feeling in my gut and this is what I was feeling in my chest. And I felt that heat come up at the top of my head. Mm -hmm. I felt that tightness in my shoulders. Our bodies are trying to help us and it's up to us to be able to listen. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I think that's the that's the key. I think the key and the great place to end here today is the key to is all about listening, right? Listening to your body, listening to yourself, listening to other people, really trying to actually absorb information as opposed to just scan through it again, which is, you know, how, how our culture tells us now is, oh, you don't need to don't need to pay attention to anything. You can just scan through everything. But paying attention and listening is so critical. And one other thing, which is so important for everyone to know, which is that the great news is that positive change can happen at any point. We are built for change. Yeah, no, absolutely. I was that old saying, what's the best time to plant a tree? Was it 20 years ago? And the next best time is today. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> well, listen, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Riger. Um, all of Dr. Riger's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Thank you, John. Yes, uh, Dr. Risa Riger. I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm in private practice. And also, I work with individuals, teams, and companies to help them integrate and create the change that they are really looking to see. It's not just feel good. It's like, what do you do to implement every single day so that the change is there? Yeah, absolutely. And I would highly, highly recommend you go check out uh, check out Dr. Riger's work and, and all the things that she does, because I do think this is I think you're at the cutting edge of what I think is a very critical change in in how we operate, not just in work, but in life in general. And I think we owe it to ourselves to give ourselves all the best tools. So I, I would encourage you to go check out Dr. Riger. Listen again. Sorry, go on. Oh, yeah. And one more thing. I, I will be reprimanded if I don't say to please do follow me on Instagram. I post, I post, I put up videos, find me on Instagram, find me on LinkedIn to get the latest in information to help you in your lives every day. Excellent. There you go. Go on Instagram and actually look at something useful for a change. <laughs> but but avoid the ads, avoid the ads, because I find them totally addictive. I have to stop myself buying everything that pops up on Instagram. <laughs> 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 all right well listen thanks again uh, thanks again dr Ryder. thank you for watching and listening and i will see you all again soon thank you